The other thing that I just wanted to reference, and this is one of the questions that came up, and we'll probably talk about it more this afternoon, but again, a consistent question is, how do I grow in the prophetic? You know, when there's no one around, I, many of you are starting to have dreams, you see, see visions, things are happening, and you're trying to understand, what does this mean? And, you know, we really are in, in a transition of the body of Christ to, you know, equip the body of Christ in this. And so sometimes you might be in a geographic location where there is no church or any leader that does that. I mean, that's how it was for me when I was first growing. There are books. I mean, there's, there's so much out there on the prophetic. That's where I learned a lot in my formative years was just reading every book I could, whatever kind of video there was. And I mean, now with YouTube and Internet, there's a plethora of things uh, out there and, you know, other good prophets that teach on much more specific things, uh, you know, that we don't, we don't cover here. But I tell you what, of all that, the way that I have grown the most in my own prophetic gifting is not through books and not through videos or even conferences. It's been by walking things out and sharing with others who are prophetic, learning trial and error, getting feedback, watching, learning, going to that secret place. That's how you really grow. Because some of these things, that you, a lot of it, it's not taught. You practice, <laughs> you know, and because even prophetically how the Lord works is so unique and specific to you that that's, that's the joy of the journey is discovering, Lord, how are you speaking to me and through me? And so even if you just find one other person that's hungry and you start praying and seeking the Lord, Holy Spirit is a great teacher. And so I really encourage you, you know, in that. And I do understand, and we'll, we'll get to that here in, in session seven in terms of if you feel called as a prophet or a leader or, you know, into ministry, uh, you just really need to pray and ask the Lord how, you know, how to connect with the, with the right leaders, with the right church. Because uh, bottom line, if he's called you, then he's going to give you the grace to do that. You know, he doesn't call someone and then say, well, sorry, there's no help for you. There is. It just might mean you got to press in a little bit more you know, and see what he, he presents to you and, and just trust him with that process. So uh, be encouraged, okay? God sees you, he knows your heart, and he wants you to grow. Amen? Okay. All right, so session six, prophetic intercession and spiritual warfare. Another very light topic to start out uh, here. <laughs> But if we're going to talk about, you know, prophetic, many of you are prophetic intercessors. That's how I grew in the prophetic was through prayer. Uh, and even in terms of prophesying to people, I am not one because of the specific grace on my life and call to the body of Christ. Things I get are for masses of people, not individuals. So I'm not one that necessarily prophesies to individuals a lot. But what I found would happen is, because I would even get freaked out, like, you know, how, how do I do this? I just started praying, and then I would begin to pray, and then later people would say, oh, man, what you said, you know, man, that's exactly right. I didn't know that I was prophesying through prayer, because you're hearing the will of the Lord, and you're just speaking, you know, what, what he's saying. And so intercession is a great uh, seedbed <laughs> for growing in hearing the voice of the Lord and speaking it. And it's very powerful, and we know we need intercession. We need, we need prayers. And so I want to talk about uh, spiritual authority in prayer. And this is one of my favorite things to talk about. I teach on it all the time. And it is referenced in my book, Moving from Sword to Scepter. So there's a lot in there as well. Because we have a question about uh, authority. And I've, I've often said, even in what we're walking through now across the globe, it's not a matter of who has the most power. It's who has legitimate authority. And so, as believers, we've been given authority. But do we know what kind of authority it is, and do we know how to use it? And so what I want to share in these three levels of authority, these are simply things that I've learned in my own journey that the Lord helped me to understand as a believer, as a daughter of the king, uh, as an intercessor, and then eventually as a prophet, the different kinds of authority and the impact that they can have and where they are properly placed. Because if we're not careful, what's often been taught is we have all authority. You know, we take that scripture. And then without thinking through it a little bit more, we begin to presume we can go anywhere at any time and claim to have authority to speak into that situation. 
So that's where the Lord put it on my heart to unpack this a little bit more because we want to be effective. And, and the scripture that's not in your outline but it's very important is James 5.16. It says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Other versions say it's powerful and effective. And when I first started praying, I'm like, I want my prayers to be effective. I'm not just petitioning and having a conversation. I want to see results. And especially if you've ever been in a situation where you feel like you're helpless and hopeless and, you know, who are you? That's when I begin to say, Lord, I want spiritual authority because I knew instinctively by the Spirit, the power that's in prayer to change things. So this is what we should be looking for in all of our prayers. There should be tangible results. That should always be our expectation. We're not just blowing hot air. We should expect that our prayers are targeted enough that we should see results. And if we don't see results, then we need to go back and adjust. Okay, how we're asking and what we're asking. Because sometimes we're praying for things that God's not even paying attention to right now. We're, we're, we're not looking where he's looking, okay? And so that's why we have to go back to him. So let's look at these three uh, areas to start out with. Granted, gained, and given authority. And the first one that I list here is the granted spiritual authority that is given to every believer through the blood of the cross. When we accept Jesus Christ as Lord, we have been given authority because of what he did for us. And this is in Luke 9, 1 to 3. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Okay, now I want you to understand this is Christianity 101. Matthew 10, 7 to 8 says, The kingdom of uh, you were supposed to go out, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. From day one, this is our commission, people. <laughs> what? Heal the sick. Notice he doesn't say pray for the sick. He says heal the sick. I don't ever find a, a place where Jesus prayed and asked. He commanded healing. Raise the dead. Cleanse lepers. In our day, that's COVID. Cast out demons. In our day, that's COVID. <laughs> I read, I, I did a blog about this. <laughs> so this is granted to all of us because of what Jesus did for us at the cross. This is available. And he's saying, this is what I've charged you to do. You have the authority that I have. So before we claim to have authority over a region or a territory, <laughs> you have authority in your own home, over your own life, to see God work in this way. Now, Obviously, you know, this is ideal, yes, but this is the practice, and this is where we should focus on and grow in, because it is a growing process. You know, let's face it, we don't, we don't see our, our prayers manifested, you know, the answers all the time, but this is what the Lord is, is calling us to and wanting us to grow in, that this is what we can expect. This is the granted authority, and I have it. It's given as a ground-level authority to set people free. Notice that that's what Jesus told, go out okay, and, and preach the kingdom, demonstrate the kingdom. So this is with people that we see all around us, in our families, in, in our communities, is to display and demonstrate the power of God. So that's granted to everybody, and it starts at home. Now the second level is what I call gained authority, and this comes by overcoming the devil in your own personal life. We all have issues. We, we all have uh, challenges. We all have strongholds that we get free of. We all have, you know, turmoil that we confront and unanswered questions. But as we overcome, there is an authority then that we gain because of that. Jesus exemplified this when he went into the wilderness. Remember, he was fully God, but he was fully man. And so it says that he was in Luke 4, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert. He was led by the Spirit into the dark night of the soul, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And we know he overcame. So Jesus returned to Galilee now in the power of the Spirit. 
And news about him spread through the whole countryside. This is why we embrace trials and temptations in the wilderness experience. We can be filled with the Spirit, but when we press in and persevere, do not quit, and we overcome, we are now filled with a greater power and a greater authority. Because that's what Jesus did. And so if, if you look at your own life and testimony, what are those things that you have battled through? What are those things that you have confronted and been challenged by that you pressed in, you persevered, and you came out victorious? And you are still going. There is a grace on your life and an authority in prayer for someone else who's in that place because you have overcome. And so pay attention to those things that you might think, man, I barely made it through, but you're on the other side. You overcame. There is an authority there. And don't be surprised if God doesn't send you people who are going through the very same thing. There's a reason for that because he knows what you carry. And there's a grace that you can impart to them that they too can overcome. And so in our prayers, this is something we are mindful of, that as we speak and as, as the Lord presents things to us, either through people or situations, you know, to understand that, that gained authority that will give you confidence in knowing that you can pray. And, and that's where we just are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And that's why even uh, prayer gatherings, prayer groups coming together because all of those experiences... <laughs> Coming together, there is a, a corporate anointing and authority because of all the testimonies, because of what you have, have been through, you testify to the victory of Christ, and you can pray. So authority increases in every victory gained, and I put here Ezekiel's life. I've referenced Ezekiel before, an amazing prophet of the Lord, but if you read his story, he was continually tested. The Lord called him as a sign. His life was a sign. Everything he went through was crazy. God asked him to do crazy things, and he was rejected. He was misunderstood. The Lord even took his wife from him and told him, you can't even mourn because this is a sign. And that's why when he was brought before that valley of dry bones, the Lord could give him that kind of authority to speak to the bones that they would live because he had already been tested and tried and come through with an authority to speak to that. And, and I'd reference, you know, the, the end of his life as well, the, the commission to, to continue to speak. And so there is this pattern of authority that is, is gained. You know, I've experienced that same thing in terms of early on, and this is part of my testimony in getting free from religious Jezebel and Leviathan spirits. I share the story of, of me realizing the strongholds in my own life and going through deliverance in that, and then finding myself in situations, even over in Africa, dealing with witchcraft that I had never even realized is the same spirit <laughs> as religion. And me finding that I had authority to see deliverance come. This is the power of it. And this is what, what the Lord wants us to be in touch with, of, of those things that we have been through. Because it gives you confidence. You know, that's what faith is. It's a confidence. And so when you see God has, has worked in your life, that builds your faith then to keep going. Revelation 2.26 says, The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. That's very powerful. Again, this, this, the power of persistence. To him who conquers and keeps my works until the end, keep pressing in. I will give authority over the nations. So that's gained authority. Now, given authority, this is through affirmation of the body and recognized spiritual authorities. This is an authority that is given to us by others. And that can come through different means. The reference here that I, I have is Numbers 27, 18 through 20. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him, have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. So here this was very important. God told Moses, because it was evident that God had called Moses, that he had authority. But it was time now to pass that on. And so in front of the whole assembly, 
He laid hands on Joshua as a sign, I am giving you some of that authority that God has given me. And so this is a pattern, and we see this even in, in the New Testament as well, of laying on of hands, of this giving of, of authority, because there is a recognized call. See, that's what it is. It's a recognized call upon someone's life, and then someone who has already been given that authority in that position of leadership affirms that, blesses it, and commissions. So in Mark 1, to 28, it says the people... Oh, actually, I'm jumping ahead, but I'll go ahead. Wait a minute. Acts 13, 2 to 3. This is the scripture. It's not in your manual, but this is the illustration I was thinking of. This was while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. The Holy Spirit said, this is to the disciples, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Okay, so that was the, the New Testament example of the same thing where a call was recognized, and then the leaders prayed for them and commissioned them. And which, by the way, I'd, I'd studied this, and there's an example where if you follow those, this was the practice of the early apostles, that they would lay hands and commission and send out apostles, prophets, fivefold leaders. And that's where you saw the fruit. That's where you saw the greatest blessing. But in one instance, uh, I think it was... Barnabas and Saul, now I'm forgetting the details, we don't read of them having hands laid on them and commissioned. And you don't hear anything. It says they went, you know, to minister places, but you don't hear anything about it. And I remember reading that. It just stood, stood out to me of how important it is of this commissioning and sending because there's a corporate blessing, and that has power in the Spirit. Well, when there's a corporate agreement, see, it's this agreement. This is what has power in intercession. It's agreement. And that's, that's what that does, is that, that public commissioning, um, which also happens when even in a gathering like this, when there is an agreement and, and uh, an affirmation of someone that's ministering, there has power in the spirit. I can tell you as one who, who speaks, and Bobby feels the same thing, you know, when we're ministering and people are drawing it, because there's an agreement, there's an acknowledgement, there's a hunger for it, there, the anointing increases because it's the power of, of that agreement. Because we can also feel it when we're in a room and people aren't, <laughs> aren't engaging, <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, we are hitting a wall here. It's like, boom. But it's this dynamic, okay, uh, of just recognizing the power of our agreement and affirmation when we see a call, when we see an anointing. And so this is important because those who are called, this is the reason I, why I say it, when you are called, rather than heading out on your own because you are called, and we'll talk about this in, in the next session, is to remember the power of being sent, <laughs> being recognized, acknowledged, and sent. This is why the tie with the local church is so important. This is why those who just go out on their own, they hit a ceiling, they will bear a measure of fruit, but they will, they will not reach their fullest potential because they have not been properly sent and commissioned. And so this is something that we want to see happen. So understanding these three kind of levels of authority uh, obviously can help us as individuals as we're growing you know, in our own gifting and call, but it also should empower in terms of intercession and prayer to understand you know, the authority that, that we can properly use in praying. Uh, now, I'll just finish this section out here. Corporate authority, I, I've already kind of mentioned a little bit. But in Acts 4, 32, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common and with great power. The apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. And so that's just another illustration of, of what I'm talking about, this corporate agreement, this oneness uh, of spirit. So this spheres of authority, I've kind of referenced. Let's look at this for a little bit, of understanding our, our fields of authority. 
In 2 Corinthians 10, 12 through 11, 1, it says, and this is the, I think this is Paul speaking. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the field God has assigned to us. For we do not want to boast about work already done in another man's territory. Well, now this is interesting. What is Paul talking about? As a called apostle, he was aware that he had a very specific call and field where God called him, go here, speak to these people. And even as, as Bobby had referenced in an earlier session, you know, some were called to the Jews, some were called to the Gentiles. Those are two different fields. And so the awareness of that, that's where the grace of God is going to flow. So it wasn't a matter of well, can't I speak to them? Well, yeah, you can. You know, if you're called to the Jews, you can speak to the Gentiles. But because that's not your primary field, the weight of your authority, it, it may not be the same. And so recognizing that field that you are called to, the people that you are called to, the place that you are called to is very important. It's to know the field and to recognize that leaders, every leader has a field that they have been uh, assigned. So uh, some other scriptures here. Galatians 2, 8, for God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. Okay, I referenced that. And I, I referenced Old Testament prophets. They, they had fields. Uh, Jonah was called to Nineveh. Daniel was called to Babylon. Moses to Egypt. Very specific. We each have a unique field. Leaders have authority in their assigned field. So prophecy, prophets, must always defer to the established leader in any field. Now this is referencing perhaps a, a pattern of a previous generation, but when we were in the time of pretty much platform prophets going through you know, cities and, and coming and speaking, this is what I kind of grew up with is you know, the prophet comes into town and then speaks a word, uh, you know, over the region, freedom and deliverance and everything, and everyone says, yay, you know, and the prophet leaves, and now we're all waiting for it to just happen. <laughs> and then they wonder why nothing happens. But the prophet spoke it. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I mean, a prophet can come in and open the door, but it's the people that live there that have to walk it out. You're the one that has to contend for it. And so this is where, you know, especially as five-fold ministers, we have to realize that I'm not going to presume anything. Now, this happened recently. I was in North Dakota, did a women's conference there, and there was a lot of warfare coming up to it because I was working with a, a group of ladies there planning it. And I knew in my spirit it was a very strategic kind of undercover operation because of what's there in North Dakota. But I really felt like the Lord was saying, you need to take communion before you even start just to cover everything. But I really felt in my spirit... I don't have jurisdiction there. So I told my team, can you please invite in a local pastor to lead us in that time of communion? It didn't matter that I was the prophet coming in to speak. I wanted, they, I wanted them to own it. And so they did. They brought in the pastor of this Bible camp where I was speaking. And he wasn't a part of, of the weekend at all. I don't even know who, if he knew who I was. It didn't matter. But he, he was excited about what God wanted to do. And so he led us in communion. So it's that kind of picture of recognizing the fields that we are called to. And so pastors, they've been assigned their field of their congregation. And the pastors of a, a city, that's their field. And so whether or not you're a five-fold minister or just an intercessor, you recognize those authorities and you honor that. And you don't just presume because God's put this in your spirit to pray that you have all authority to declare that in that church or in that city. Because God will always defer to the primary leaders that he's called there as the shepherds, as the apostles. And so this is huge. We're gonna be talking about this more in the last session of our collaboration, communication, especially between intercessors and leaders. Because this agreement is so important and when we can be so separated. And the fact is, you know, if you spend a lot of time in prayer, you are going to be confident because you're going to hear from the Lord. But that just always needs to be yielded and submitting to the local leaders. Even if it means they don't accept it, you've got to be good with that and say, this is it's the Lord's word. It's not mine. He'll deal with it. Okay? So in terms of prophetic intercession, I just included some quotes here that I thought were really good. First one is James Gall. 
in terms of defining, you know, what is prophetic intercession? He says, prophetic intercession is not as much praying to God as it is praying with God. We let go of our agendas and we take the time to receive the desires that are in God's heart. Thus, prophetic intercession or revelatory prayer is praying with God. I think that's pretty cool. Another one, prophetic prayer occurs when we pray with insights, prophetic revelation, received from the Holy Spirit. We may receive these insights during prayer or pray about revelation that has already been received. We can all pray prophetically. However, a prophetic intercessor is not only equipped with insight from the Spirit, the prophetic intercessor becomes the vessel through whom the Spirit himself prays. Now, this kind of gets to the idea of, depending on how you're wired and gifted, of actually being the vessel that God expresses himself through. This is why intercessors, if you, you, know, you find yourself crying or weeping, you're feeling the heart of God. Other times when you pray, you know, you just feel an intense burn, burning in your heart for something. It's the heart of God. You become that vessel that he expresses himself through. Because there is power in intercession in, in feeling with God. Things need to be expressed. This is why the, the blood of Abraham still cries out from the land. There are things that need to be expressed. God wants to express his heart. It's not just some static truth. It's his heart for his people. And so when we allow ourselves to be vessels that he expresses himself through, there is a release that can happen in the spirit. This is why in Romans, when it says we don't know how to pray, but there are groanings. That's not just, I don't know what else to do. No, there's power in that. You know, if you've ever felt, I mean, some, a couple of times I've felt this, you know, the birthing pains, you know, and, and feeling that. There's power in that. And even though it can be unsettling and uncomfortable and embarrassing, you know, you learn when it's the Spirit that I'm a vessel, Lord. Express yourself through me because something is happening, you know, in the Spirit that is very powerful. Now, this last quote then, a prophetic mindset is an ongoing realization that what you want and need from God already exists in your kingdom account, and all you need to do is withdraw it from the supernatural and embody it in the natural. So this is where our faith is activated. We realize everything has been provided for us already. And so we have to keep that in mind. This is why we have to have the word of God in us. Because faith, that's the launching pad for prayer. Remember, it's not prayer that changes things. It's our faith behind those prayers that changes things. It's that absolute confidence. This is God's will. And this is you know, a change from years ago, again, you know, growing up and praying, Lord, if it is your will, and on and on we go. I mean, I remember as a, as a college student, I was trying to find a, a church. It was before I was married, and, and the one church that I found that it was closest to anything that I thought was good, they were very much teaching, you know, we, there's this mysteries of God. We just can't know God's will. Uh, you know, kind of have to do the best you can. And I was like, wait a minute, is that, is that true? I can't know what God's will is? And I mean, you find it, James 1.15 says, if you lack wisdom, ask God, and he will give it generously without finding fault. E Ephesians 5.17 says, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. God wants us to know what his will is. We should never have to pray, God, if it's your will. There's, that's nowhere in the Bible. You can say, I, make me willing, <laughs> but God wants us to know what his will is. Uh, he wants us to know the answer. Now, sometimes he'll say no. Sometimes he will defer us. Actually, this is, I, I put this as an example. Um, my own you know, journey of, of healing from tinnitus, uh, which, you know, getting better and better. Uh, you know, the tormenting spirits was delivered from, from that. But, you know, I, I keep going to God about updating because there's still a little bit there. And the last time I asked him, you know, I started the conversation, you know, Lord, uh, about this ring. <laughs> and he looks at me and he says, what ring? <laughs> now, he wasn't saying it as a rebuke. But what I saw was that he was fixed on something else. And it was as if he was saying, Wanda, I know there's a ring, but we need to go here. And if we go there, that'll, that'll be taken care of. See, he's pointing me to the throne room, to his glory. He said, that's where we need to go. I, I know about the ring. Don't worry about that. 
Now, see, that totally shifted how I pray. I could waste my time going against this thing and binding the enemy and all this kind of thing simply because I didn't stop and say, Lord, what about this again? (laughs) And then be open to what he might want to show you that we're praying rightly. He wants us to know what his will is. The Isaiah 55 passage here, obviously the word of God has to be in us. First written word and then that rhema word. But this says, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This is actually very powerful, even in terms of prophetic words. There there is a purpose for which God sends prophecies. And we need to ask ourselves, why was that prophesied? We can't presume. You'll just have to think on that. There's something to that but this is why we have to have the word of God inside of us love must be the primary motivator we've we've talked on that before Jude 20 and 21 but you beloved building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life this has to be our, our motivation even against the enemies of God, that we keep love in our heart. We've got to love God more than hating the enemy. In our day and time, that can be challenging because when we see the darkness and the wickedness, there should be a holy, righteous indignation that rises up. But we can't let that consume us. We've got to keep that in line with the love of God because there is a mercy the part of our flesh doesn't want to acknowledge. (laughs) There is a mercy, and this is why many times the wait and the delay, it's because of God's mercy. So we have to be in touch with that, especially in prayer, that there's mercy being extended. God, give give me your heart again, the fullness of your heart. Because he sees his enemies. He knows exactly what's going on. But we need to stay in, in line, make sure that our hearts are guarded by love. Also, we need to know the angel armies are waiting for the word. Psalm 103:20 it says, "Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word." Now again, there's there's other teachers that teach much more uh, extensively on angels and and working with them. The only thing that I, I want to say here uh, is in terms of, you know, how much do I've already referenced, we can converse with angels. There is an interaction there. Obviously, we, that's not our priority. It's not our focus. But they are listening for the word of the Lord. Now, I don't want to get lost in technicalities. But in terms of how I've approached it is, if you go back to what we had said, the Lord says, listen for what I say and then repeat what I say. See, the angels are listening, too, to what he says. And so they're just listening for us to repeat what God has said. Now, this is different than us just deciding, angels, go do this. Angels, go do that. I commission you to do this. It's the same thing as just coming up with a prophecy. I'm going to prophesy this. I'm going to prophesy that. The bottom line is we have to ask the Lord first, what is your word regarding this? How do you want your angels involved in this? Ask him specifically. What is your word, you know, for me to to commission the angels? To me, that's the safest place, okay, to stay in line that I'm speaking what God says, not just a good idea on my own. And as we speak his word, now obviously this is the power of, of praying the word out loud because it is his will. It is his word. And so We can speak that, but obviously when we're talking about commissioning angels and seeing tangible results, that that is the goal is to be very specific with the word. Because we can pray generalities, but our desire should be, Lord, make this more specific and tangible. What exactly do you want me to, to target? Where are you targeting right now? You know, in this mountain or in this city, what specific stronghold, you know, do we need to go after? Uh... And as you're more targeted, then you can test that out and ask the Lord because the angels are here and and they are waiting for for his word. But see, they work in honor as well. 
and they are totally submitted to the king. And so that's what we want to operate in. Also, prophetic actions can produce supernatural release. Again, this is in the context of prophetic intercession. And here's one example from the Old Testament in 2 Kings 13. Elisha the prophet said, take a bow and arrows. And so he took a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, okay, draw the bow. And he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands and he said, open the window eastward. And he opened it. And the prophet said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria, for you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. So here the prophet gave the king instructions to do a prophetic act that released something in the spirit. And it was an act of faith. And many times this will happen in intercession when we are praying for our church or praying for our community, that there will be things that the Lord, just ideas that we can put our faith into action. Remember, faith is dead unless it's acted on, <laughs> okay? It's not just words, but okay, Lord, how do you want us to activate our faith, to do something tangible with this? And this is, you know, why we uh, anoint land with, with oil or we'll put stakes in the ground. You know, these are based upon scriptures that we're wanting to literally demonstrate our faith that this word is the word of the Lord. And we are going to contend to see the fulfillment of this, okay? Now, a, a recent example, again, for me, uh, was if you listen to my, my testimony here about the tinnitus, is the Lord led me to do this very strange and unusual protocol, and I'm not going to get into what that was, but it was very unconventional, and there were some risks to it. But I was desperate, and we prayed. We knew the Lord had led us to that, and so we just, in faith, we decided, okay, by faith, we are, I'm going to take this. And when I did, if you listen to my testimony... Uh, the Spirit of God came on me. I mean, uh, the joy of the Lord and His presence took me to the floor, delivered me from the spirit of fear. And from that point on, every time I took a dose of that, Holy Spirit came and tangibly and, and rested on me for about an hour. Now, you know, through that whole, because that lasted for quite a, a while, it was a prophetic act because it wasn't really about the protocol. It was a my faith put into action because the very first time he told me Wanda I am rewarding your faith you totally trusted me because you knew the risks <laughs> and you were willing to do it so I just say that because you know ask the Lord what can I do to demonstrate my absolute trust and this is why you know you need to you know, you need to know you've heard from him and if you have okay Lord how can I show this that I've, I've heard from you and I trust you and he will reward that so, this is fun, right? It's always a journey as to how God wants to interact with us as we pray about things. So, that kind of covers in terms of just some, some things about prayer and how the prophetic can work in, in our hearing from the Lord, listening, engaging, uh, you know, with the angelic realm, always wanting to see tangible results, Okay. But now let's look at this in terms of prophetic intercession, the spiritual warfare, specifically relating to, you know, a region uh, or, or our city. And I'm just going to touch on this uh, briefly because uh, I do, again, touch on this in moving from sword to scepter, and I've got some other videos on this. But this is the passage that we often go to, Ephesians 6, about spiritual warfare. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And then it goes through and talks about taking up the armor of God. So it's a reminder. Okay, we're dealing with large forces. It's not people. It's a spiritual battle. But let's just define what are we talking about when we say principalities and territorial spirits. Principalities are ruling spirits. Because they are the principal spirit that's ruling over an area. And these are geographic. They are specific to land because of the people that are living in that land. And so principalities really indicate high-ranking ruling principal spirits over, and it's usually like a state, I mean a large portion of land, because... 
the people that are on the land are believing a lie, in agreement with the enemy, many times without even knowing it, because there's sin that's rampant, and it's usually very specific. You know, different areas are known for different things. And so this is how principalities form. It's because of the people on the land and their corporate agreement, their negative agreement. And so this is the job of the church, see, to displace that agreement with a better agreement. Okay? So it has to be a displacement process. The territorial spirit is also very uh, geographic because it's according to a territory. And here's a, a, an example both in Old Testament and New Testament. In 1 Kings 20, it says, Then the prophet came near to the king of Israel and said to him, and this is in, in the context of a battle, Come, strengthen yourself, and consider well what you have to do. For in the spring the king of Syria will come up against you. And the servants of the king of Syria said to him, their gods are gods of the hills. And so they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. So what were they referencing? They, they knew that their gods, because of their corporate agreement, that in the hills, in that territory, they had a, authority. And so they, they realized, we don't want to fight there. Let's fight them here where we have authority. In the New Testament, this is also displayed in, in the demoniac in Mark 5, 9 and 10. Jesus asked him, what is your name? And this man who was demonized, he replied, my name is Legion for we are many. And he begged Jesus earnestly not to send them out of the country. And that word actually means territory. Why would that be? The, the demons themselves, don't send us out of this territory. Because the demons knew we have legal authority here. If you send us to another territory, they're not going to agree with us. We won't have any power. We won't have any authority. So this is why in intercession, every city and town is going to be different. And this is the intercessory goal is, you know, if you, if you are called to pray for your city, okay, Lord, how can we displace? How can we bring in your kingdom here? What's in the way that we can see your kingdom established? And, and I put it that way specifically that, don't make it your focus of just rebuking and binding the devils and territorial spirits. The goal is always to displace them with something better. So that's why you need to make sure that the majority of your prayer time is much more blessing and uh, declaring the kingdom purposes rather than just magnifying the enemy. He loves that. He loves negative press. Don't give him some, so much time. Acknowledge him, but then learn from the Lord is exactly what it is. Okay, Lord, what's the opposite of that? What do you want to see happen? And then you, you pray accordingly. I have here, corporate agreement is what empowers principalities and powers over region. This was demonstrated in Acts 8, 9 through 13, in Simon, the sorcerer. It says, now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention. So, see, they were yielding to his anointing. And they exclaimed, this man is the divine power known as the great power. And they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, now a couple of verses earlier, it says, Philip the evangelist came in and was declaring the kingdom of God and demonstrating the kingdom of God. So when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Okay, so what was this strategy to defeat this territorial spirit? Was it going in and having a prayer march? Was it, was it you know, going in and, and doing flags? And I'm not saying any of that is, is not right if that's what the Lord directs. What I'm wanting to show here is the power of this corporate agreement. When someone, all they needed to see was the real thing. They were blinded because this is what they thought it was. Because there was no church. <laughs> there was no believer. There was no kingdom authority there to demonstrate this is the real thing. As soon as the people saw the real thing, it broke the power of the spell. This is the power of demonstrating the kingdom. I think if we would do more of this rather than railing against the enemy, we could see amazing results and much more evangelism would happen. 
because people are hungry to see a God that is powerful and does things. <laughs> the enemy wants to do all kinds of things, you know, counterfeits to, to draw people's attention. And so to me, this is, this is what our commission is, is to demonstrate the kingdom reality. Notice the apostles' consistent goal. It was to build up the church, not necessarily to take down the enemy. It's very interesting. If you go through the book of Acts and see how, how the apostles, you know, did this and realize their culture, I mean, they were, they were in a much more of a, a measure of cultural warfare, just like we are, okay? I mean, Rome was the occupying force. Okay, they were persecuted. They were martyred. And yet the consistent pattern throughout the book is they rejoiced when they were persecuted. They discerned proper timing. They prayed. They appealed to those who were hungry. They sought to establish governing leaders before proceeding. They were very specific in understanding we've got to bring kingdom demonstrations here first. And even in terms of, because there are some examples, and I, I won't take the time to go into them, where at times the apostles, they would go into a city and they would see it was so rampant in wickedness. But if there was no established church there, they knew they really couldn't do anything because there was no uh, proper kingdom jurisdiction. And so this was their call. We've got to raise up leaders. We've got to raise up men and women who have a call and commission of the Lord to go to these places that have been given that kind of authority and then to build and establish something to displace this. See, that's long-term. That's the apostolic call. Because to, to go in, they knew that they couldn't just go in and bind things because there was no one there to, to maintain the ground. This is why it's so important. We've got to think long-term in, in planting kingdom leaders and kingdom believers to keep the ground. It's not a matter of taking it. It's keeping it. <laughs> this is the charge. We, we've had a lot of revivals in this nation. We've had a lot of outpourings. Why don't they last? Well, some of them aren't meant to, to last, but I think it's because we haven't had the leadership in place, the, the ecclesia demonstrations in place to keep what God wants to be a lifestyle of his spirit here. So this is our charge, it is, to, is to do this, to establish this. And this is why we have to persevere. We can't quit. We can't give up because this is long term. So here in, in, in your uh, outline, then the last thing I have here is just some keys, and you, I'm just referring this. It, it's in the book, Moving from Sword to Scepter, Chapter 11. I really highlight, if you are called to pray for a city, these are just some practical steps and keys to look for that you are effective in that uh, and how you can do that. So you, you can read those and, and refer to those. But I love Psalm 110 because this really kind of encapsulates God's heart knowing that we live in the in the middle of warfare <laughs> it says the Lord says to my Lord sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter rule in the midst of your enemies in other words you don't have to wait for the devil to be gone before you can really come and do something good this is what we're learning to do right now God is saying, come on, church. Come on, believers. You've got to rise up, take the scepter, and rule as a kingdom ambassador. It doesn't matter what the de The devil's going to do what the devil does. Okay? You've got to learn to look past that. I mean, it, again, you know, my own experience with this noise in my head has been training. The Lord's been training me. Don't keep focusing on that. Focus on me. Keep your eyes fixed there and keep going. And, and sooner or later, that, that noise diminishes. And, and that's the reality of the, the authority that we have and the persevering faith and what it accomplishes is that the Spirit of God comes in and, and He changes us first. <laughs> and, and He gives us this confidence and this sense of His presence that we know ultimately He wants to come and live in a place and really show Himself strong. Amen? Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you have called us to this amazing place of prayer, that you have actually enabled and equipped us to stand in the gap and to speak for you, to have this connection with your heart, Lord, that we can know what's on your heart. We can say it, and that, Lord, we have the authority through Christ, Lord, to displace 
all the works of darkness, Lord, and to see your kingdom come. Father, this is our desire. And so I just pray, Lord, that what has been taught, what has been imparted, Holy Spirit, just continue to feed that, water it, nurture it. And I pray that each one that's listened, you will show them how to apply and appropriate these principles in meaningful ways. Lord, we want to see tangible results. We want to see your kingdom come in our communities, in our cities, in our nations, that, Lord, you would be seen and known. So start with us, Lord, that we could be ambassadors, a son and daughter that walks in and demonstrates your power and authority. And we will give all glory back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.